of hell in their daily language. They typically use it when they're angry and saying ill things to one another. And the interesting thing is, though, if you look around different cultures, you find that hell is very common. You will find hell in a range of different cultures around the world, and particularly and strangely, a lot of those who have volcanic activity of some shape or form near them. Places where they see open lava and they see lots of burning and smoke and sulfurous fumes, a lot of those cultures have a very strong understanding or thought inclination towards hell. They, they tend to believe in hell because they see burning things from below the earth's surface. Islam, we know, has a strong belief in hell and uh, that's an Islamic uh, portrait or an Islamic uh, piece of art. Um, the Jain religion believes in seven levels of hell, which is very interesting for a couple of reasons. And um, people, as you see in this, this imagery of Jain art, are punished in several different ways in hell, either being bitten by dogs or impaled on sp spikes. You know, really awful things. Even in African tradition from East Africa, you see here is, uh, uh, this is from, from East Africa, from uh, Selassie uh, territory. You see a whole lot of people getting thrown into the heart of this terrible abyss where there's fire and there's a, a nasty creature doing terrible things to them. You even go as far out as Burma and you see similar thoughts that when people die according to their traditions, if they've done wrong, they get put into a burning cauldron and soaked with oil and other terrible things. So you can see a similar type of thinking persists around the world. And the Western view, which most of us have, either directly by our ancestors or by some of the missionaries who came to South Africa and brought these thoughts to South Africa, the Western view is traditionally based on mostly Greek and Roman and probably a little bit of Zoroastrian origins. So the Greeks and the Romans really did believe very strongly in the underworld, in a place of the dead where you would be taken across a great river, the river sticks into the netherworld, and people would pay the boatman to take them in this terrible journey to the, to the other side of the river. In fact, that's where one of the old traditions of putting coins on the eyes of the dead was, so that they would have the money to pay the boatman to take them to the other side of the river, the land of the dead. And the Zoroastrian religion is a very interesting one. It's a very ancient religion that still exists to this day from Persia, modern-day Iran. And a lot of the thoughts that people have came from the Zoroastrian religion, even Greek, it influenced Greek and other thinking. But the Zoroastrians used to believe in everything having a balance. So if there was a good God, there was an evil God. If there was a lovely place, there was a terrible place. If there was a place of peace, there was a place of fire and torment. And the Zoroastrian religion was very strongly based around an eternal flame which was kept burning in their, their religious worship. And even to this day, um, the Zoroastrian religion is based around fire. So all of these understandings of people going to the netherworld have their origins in our deep and distant past. And where a lot of Western thought has been anchored um, started in, in some way, and of course it, it preceded this, but became indoctrinated in the way that people thought in a very interesting piece of work by um, a, an Italian poet, Dante um, Alighieri. So Dante was born in Florence, and he wrote probably, as many have described it, the most in incredible piece of Italian literature that, that has ever existed. And in Dante's Divine Comedy, um, he and the, um, the, the poet Virgil, Dante and Virgil, discuss how people go down into hell and the different levels of hell which they experience for doing evil. In fact, there was a map that was created this, which included the seven circles of hell. Um, here's one representation, here's another. And just to give you a, a little bit of a tour of, of hell in, in terms of Dante's uh, work, um, you would have people at the top, at the lightest part of hell, who were just futile. Um, if you were gluttonous, you started moving down here. If you were a really bad criminal, you moved into the sixth circle of hell. 
If you're warmongers and psychopaths, you move down even further, traitors at the bottom, and ultimately Lucifer sitting at the worst bottom part of hell. But there was also a wormhole where if you were engaged in any of the, the, teven, the seven cardinal sins, which we'll come to in a moment, you could have a short circuit path to get there. It's like a, a terrible game of snakes and ladders. Um, so this influenced a lot of Western thought. And this thinking, even though it was, you know, obviously of a literature and literary nature, has pervaded the thinking of the Catholic Church and, and many others, and has in many ways codified some of the horrors that people talk about or think about in terms of hell. It led to a very interesting phenomenon in the Middle Ages. In, in the Middle Ages, a lot of people were then concerned about falling into the trap of hell. So the churches used to put on what were known as morality plays, and they would have these great touring troops of, of troubadours and, uh, and, uh, and actors who would go from town to town to try and teach people very graphically, because most people couldn't read, what the terrors of hell would be like. And they would have people falling into hell and others uh, you know, being saved and the, the entire path of human life taught in these morality plays. And you find that it influences medieval art where these thoughts of people getting burnt in different forms of hell and, and punishment are presented. Here's an example of hell with a huge open mouth swallowing everybody who was thrown out from God, just going down to this terrible place where Satan himself is swallowing up all of the people and the, the devils are there and the demons to, to help torment all these departed souls. And you can imagine if you were a person in rural England or rural Europe and these plays came to town, they could have a really serious effect on you and you'd be petrified of ending up in a terrible thing like place like that. So it had a profound effect on the psychology and the way that people thought. And of course that pervaded, you know, the Western way of religion. And many of the preachers who came to South Africa brought similar messages with them. But it's very interesting that the word hell that we have is actually a proper name. It's, you know, like my name's David. The word hell is actually the name of a person in tradition. And that's the uh, apparently a very nasty lady whose name is Hell. And um, she was a, a Norse goddess by the name of Hell, ruling over this, this terrible part of the world, which was also called Hell. So she was Hell ruling over Hell. And that word Hell, and you get it in, in for example, the, the alternative rendering of Switzerland. Switzerland's called Hell Vitica. And the word hell is in the front of the name of Switzerland, as an example. Because it was a Germanic word, halia, which means something that covered up. So when people went to hell, they went to this terrible, nasty woman who was apparently half living and half dead, half rotting while she was alive. And she would then be able to take people into the underworld and they would be covered up. So, you know, the words that people often say, you know, it's, it's a horrible phrase that people use, go to hell, used to mean, why don't you go die? And literally, it's taken a different sense in modern English, but go to hell used to mean, go die. I don't want to see you anymore. So, hell as a word is actually from this, this old Norwegian Norse goddess and has permeated our, our English and, and the modern world as well. Modern views on, on hell, though, are often quite different, aren't they? I mean, here was a, a Times, uh, sorry, an Economist cover from uh, December 2012, and um, here's the detail of it. What the, uh, the, the cartoonist there was, was trying to show is that don't worry about the hell beneath the earth. Look at the hell that human beings are creating on the earth. And he was at pains to show gluttony and sloth and pride and envy and greed and lust and all the other sins which are apparently the things that lead to hell and those are the things which he showed in this cartoon are present in today's world. 
So a lot of people today will either really believe in, in a terribly frightening place called hell, or they'll dismiss it as a joke with uh, a cartoon such, such as this and say, you just need to go to Syria today to experience real hell. So what we need to do now is just consider some religious viewpoints. So Hell, does this eternal abyss of death, damnation, and evil really exist? Hell is home to our most primal fears. It's full of torture, torment, pain for all eternity. Is hell more than a myth? There is hell fire. There is fire in hell. There is a literal fire in hell that is burning right now. To some, not only is hell real, it can be found here on Earth. An erupting volcano in Iceland. Pitch black caverns twisting beneath the jungle. A lake of fire in an African desert. These remote places share one thing in common. They are all believed to be ancient entrances to hell. For thousands of years and across countless cultures, people have believed that hell lies just below our feet. Hell was considered to be a physical place, a place that was under the earth and that you could actually visit and see with your own eyes. Across the globe, six hell mouths connect the world of the living with the world of the dead. I do believe there is a literal place of hell. I believe there must be a place for punishment. In these remote sites, explorers are unearthing passages once thought to literally be the gateways to another world. In the history of religions, one finds evidence of caves or volcanic openings that people thought were entrances into the netherworld. These gates of hell are typically located in very harsh places, in deserts, exploding volcanoes, in islands, caves. These are the kind of geographical spots where you're likely to find a portal to hell. What these explorers are finding is shocking. Getting through a cave like this is very dangerous. Some of the people that come here, they never left. It was like an abyss, a bottomless pit. It was the most hopeless, terrifying feeling that you can even imagine. Linking each site and every legend are eerily similar visions of the underworld, leading to one question that has persisted throughout history. What awaits us when we pass through the gates of hell? terrifying isn't it and you, you can see how you know a lot of ideas from different cultures have all blended into one that people from different culture cultures have all thought the same thing now here's an, another video clip this video clip was taken with the audio that apparently came from a place in Siberia where they were doing deep drilling eight kilometers down and they lo apparently lowered a microphone down into the, the, the hole and they recorded the following sounds and they, they said that these are actually terrifying sounds, but they are the sounds of the dead screaming in hell. Unbelievable. And then um, here's an example of another preacher. And, and, you know, you may have been exposed to something like this at a church you went to at some stage. It is still a place that you must deal with one day. Somebody, my friend, died this morning and they went to hell. Somebody took their last breath this day. 
July the 20th, 2008, they drew their last breath and awakened in hell. What a shock it must have been. There are those that deny that it exists, but that doesn't change it. One day you'll lift up your eyes in hell. It's descriptive talk in Luke chapter 16. When the rich man died and was buried, and the Bible says in hell, he lifted up his eyes. It's, a, it's almost as if it says he awakened in a place that was absolutely beyond his wildest imagination. He never for one time thought that such a place like that could exist. He lifted up his eyes in hell. He became aware of his presence. He knew where he was. And from that moment on, there's not a thing he could do to change his circumstance and his situation. There is no salvation in hell. There's no Savior in hell. There's no Bible in hell. There's no blood in hell. There's no altars in hell. There's no forgiveness in hell. Whatever goes to hell stays in hell. It's permanent. It's settled. It's settled. It's over with. What you've done in this life is what determines where you go. When you die without God, you go to hell. So, you know, when a person looks at that, you, you can understand how people are terrified. You know, if you don't know your Bible, you'll look at a lot of those things and you'll say, just to be safe, I better go along with them. And I think, my dear friends, you really are doing yourself a big disservice if you do that, because you need to open your Bibles and challenge these things for yourself. So what, what I'd like to do now is just pick up some of the summary views on hell. And these, it's not exhaustive. But if you had to look around and ask people who believe in hell what they think it's about, they would say, well, it's a place below the earth. They'd say it's very real. It's a place for eternal punishment, a place where there's only evil. You know, plainly, it's a terrible place. It's a place where there's physical pain because people can scream and cry and suffer and feel all these things. It's a fiery place, obviously. It's a place where only sinners go. It's a place of thick darkness, despite the fire. It's got limitless capacity, and it's a place for the devil and demon tormentors to make life miserable forever for the people who are consigned to hell. So those may be some of the ideas, and you, you may have heard some of them, probably. So I'd like us just to have a look at these issues. Maybe just pick one or two of them and go through them. So I'm going to go through five. And just have a look and see whether they make sense with the Bibles open on your laps. Because what we're interested in here is what the Word of God says. We don't want people shouting and screaming and making us afraid without us reading God's Word. I want the comfort of God's Word in my life, and I'm sure you do too. So maybe what we need to do is look at this in terms of what the Bible says. So the first issue I have is that of the devil in hell. So... If we had to ask the question, hell is a place of the devil and demons, it's completely godless, right? And some people would say, well, yep, that is the case. It's a godless, terrible, frightening place. Well, what we need to firstly understand is that there was somebody who wrote about this, a really good authority. It was a man called King David. And Acts chapter 13 tells us something about King David. If you don't know much about him, take what is said in Acts 13 about King David to heart. God raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Isn't that interesting? So here's a man who God raised up, who can speak on behalf of God because he was attuned to God. He was at one with God. All right? So what did David say about hell? David said something very interesting. And it's Psalm 139, verses 7 to 8. And you can look it up, look it up in your own time. And you'll notice from verse 1, this is speaking about God. Verse 1 talks of God. Verses 7 to 8. Where can I go from your spirit, God? Says David. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Did you get that? This is speaking about God. David said if he made his bed in hell, 
You, God, are there. Where's there? It's hell. We either have to believe what David says or we don't. That's a very interesting scripture. So, so note that one down, that God is truly everywhere, including hell. That's the only conclusion we can come to. There's no other conclusion we can draw from that. Scripture says God is also present in hell. So the next point I'd like to pick up is the issue with sinners. Remember we said at the beginning that, well, you know, this is a place where really nasty people go and sinners go. So the first question is, hell is for sinners only, right? You know, because people say that you know, other people go to heaven or, or something else. So hell is only for sinners. Well, we've got to ask ourselves the question, was Jesus a sinner? Now, I think all of us here would answer that automatically, that we would know that this is the key characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter tells us plainly, in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 22, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps to be like him, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So Peter is quite plain that Jesus did no sin. So I think we all agreed with that. But then, my dear friends, please would you just note down the next verse, because the next verse is the one that would cause you a lot of problems if you had that idea that hell was for sinners only. Because I have to tell you a sad thing, if you believe in hell according to those preachers, Jesus went to hell. Did you know that? In Acts chapter, 20, Acts chapter 2, verses 31, verse 31, and of course, what we're getting here is a quotation from Psalm 16. So it's a quote from Psalm 16, and you can put the two next to each other and you can compare them. And it's a great thing to always compare Scripture with Scripture. In Acts chapter 2, he, again, King David, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, you can only be left in hell, or not left in hell, if you were there. If Jesus hadn't gone to hell, he couldn't have been resurrected out of hell. You see, that's the plain and simple reading of these verses. If you disagree with me, please let's talk about it afterwards. But that's what the verses say. And that's what the importance of Psalm 16 is. That hell itself couldn't hold Jesus. He had to come out because God raised him and resurrected him from his hell. And yet, the sad truth is, my dear friends, hell is to be a one-way trip for the wicked. So people who don't know God are not vaguely interested in him. Hell can be a true one-way trip for them. Have a look at Job 21, verses 30 to 32. Job is speaking, and Job says the following things. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. And that word grave there is the Hebrew word for hell in the Bible. These are people who are wicked. God says through Job that they're going to go to the grave and they're going to remain there. They're going to go to hell and stay in hell. There'll be no path out for them. So our conclusion, the second conclusion is, hell is not only for sinners, and going to hell is not always a one-way journey. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So the third point then that we need to look at is the, the question of knowledge. And by that I mean, in hell, sinners will know that they've made terrible choices and regret them forevermore, right? In other words, if you want to really punish somebody, you've got to keep them awake and alive in some form that they can be punished and said, you did wrong, you did wrong, you did wrong, and they can suffer torment forever and ever. They've got to know they made the wrong choices and suffer forever and ever and ever. 
Not so, according to the traditional view of hell. But again, we need to consider the origins of these things. So I said I was going to come to this, this concept of the seven deadly sins. And if any of you have been in, in a Catholic environment or Catholic school or anything of that nature, you would have heard of the seven deadly sins or also the seven cardinal or seven capital sins. They might have been told to you in those different ways. And you can, you can pick this up on the internet or in books and everywhere else. But these seven sins actually are the ones that, remember at the bottom of Dante, that was the short circuit to get to, to the lowest part of hell, to be able to be pushed into hell if you did these things. And the first one is the, the sin of pride. And on the right of it is what the punishment was, to be broken on the wheel. And I'm going to pick up just three out of these seven for a very good reason. The second one was envy. And that, if you were envious, you were put in freezing water forever. So in hell, which is very hot apparently, there's this place of absolute icy water that you're going to get put in forever if you're envious. The next sin was the sin of anger or hatred, and that is the punishment of being dismembered alive, that you would be feeling being cut open all the time and you would never stop being cut open all day, all night, forever. Cut, cut, cut. Absolutely awful. I mean, horrendous thoughts. That was for the sin of anger and hatred. Sloth, meaning you're lazy, you got thrown into snake pits. That would certainly keep you moving. Um, greed, if you were greedy, you were put in cauldrons of boiling oil. Gluttony, you were forced to eat rats, toads and snakes. And that was not for the French only. And then lust, if you were lustful, it was to be smothered in fire and brimstone forever. To be covered in fire and torment. And it was a really horrible suffering. So I picked up those three on the side there for a very, very good reason. Just remember what they are, envy, anger, and lust. Because there was a very wise man, and it was the son of King David. It was, it was King Solomon. And King Solomon had the following things to say. What did King Solomon have to say about these types of things? He said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 3 to 6. Ecclesiastes 9, 3 to 6. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. And when he says under the sun, he means in normal living, ordinary day-to-day -day life. That one thing happens to all. Oh, that's interesting. Now, one thing happens to all people. Truly the hearts of the son of men are full of evil. Man is in, their, is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Isn't that interesting? You would have thought that Solomon, with all his wisdom that was God-given, would have said, well, after all their madness and craziness and evil, they would have gone to this place of torment like the, the Catholics would, would tell people they would. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Just think of the implications of that. This is talking about one thing happening to everybody, to the people who were full of evil and madness, but when they die, they didn't know about their punishment. They weren't tormented because they knew nothing. That's what the Bible says. So we either have to start listening to what God says in the Bible, or we start believing the fables of what people tell us. And of course Solomon continues that they've got no reward for the memory of them is forgotten. And that's the sad truth. I mean, how many of us know details about our great-grandparents or even further back? even the ones we love, their memory is forgotten and we hardly know anything about them, not even